Joining me now from Pretoria is Mary Crew. She is co-director at the Center for the Study of AIDS. And from Los Angeles, we are joined by Ted Alamehu. He is the founder and chairman of U.S. Doctors for Africa. Mary, let me start with you. I've been looking at some figures here, and it says that South Africa has something like 370,000 new infections each year. That's about seven times the United States rate of infection. And the United States, as we know, has about six times the population of South Africa. Mary, why is Sub-Saharan Africa still the most heavily impacted HIV AIDS area? Well, I, I think there are a number of reasons, and a lot of them are historical. I, I think that countries that went through very br brutal colonial periods, and then particularly in South Africa's case, had a very brutal apartheid government, um, those experiences left a very fractured and a very dislocated population. And I think it's fair to say that you could probably trace the roots of HIV and AIDS infection into that kind of lack of social um, security and that migrant labor and res restrictive laws, incredible poverty, and a lack of access to good sanitation, good housing, the basic human rights of dignity, all of which contribute to the spread of the epidemic. In addition, I think we have um, clade C, which is an infectious um, one of the viruses. And I, I really think it's, it's a very fascinating question as, as to why sub-Saharan Africa, or certainly southern Africa, should be so badly affected. But I do think it has to, to do with the, the dislocations of people's family life and security that people have endured for many, many years now. Ted, as we've seen, you know, the infection rates in southern Africa are very, very high, but progress has been made. Oh, what are medical resources like in a place like South Africa? I mean, do they have enough doctors, nurses, clinics? availability of antiretroviral drugs? Well, I mean, sh here's the thing, you know, and we know that from, the, from this uh, HIV epidemic started back in so many years ago, when we know that over uh, uh, somewhere about 78 million or so people have been infected, and uh, approximately 71 percent of uh, uh, people living with HIV is in, in the continent of Africa, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa. So, and of course, when you look at the death threat, we have approximately about 39, 40 million people have actually been dead uh, uh, due to this HIV virus. I think since then, progress has been made. The governments of African nations are trying, and they continue to try, to come up with a sustainable uh, approach in dealing with this explosion of this virus. And, of course, the death rate is, is decreasing tremendously. Now, you, you ask a very, very, very important question. What is the medical infrastructure, and particularly the doctors? We know that in most African nations, you have one doctor per 50 to 100,000 people. So, I, you know, this is a perfect remedy for a massive disaster. I've said this a number of times in other interviews. If you don't have a... a supply and demand, if you don't have enough medical manpower to deal with crises such as this, you know, chances are the, 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 the problem will, will continue to either remain where it is now or eventually even get worse. But, you know, to give a proper credit to some of the African nations, you know, such as you know, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya and other countries, I think they have done tremendously well with creating the awareness program, educating people, and and creating the health extension workers and what have you. So uh, there's a lot needs to be done uh, because the numbers and the statistics, even out of this morning, is quite scary, in my opinion. Mary, what can you tell us about the level of teenage girls being infected in South Africa? I mean, we looked at that very briefly in our report. Is that number still very high? Well, I believe they, they are high, but, you know, I think that <clears throat> one of the problems with, with those kinds of figures and those kinds of reporting is that what's missing from it is an understanding of what might be motivating young girls to become pregnant. I don't think all pregnancies in young girls are accidental. I don't think all pregnancies in, in young girls are unwanted. And I think when you've got high rates of pregnancies, you're going to have high rates of infections because it shows you that there are high numbers of young girls who are having unprotected sex and that um, obviously there's some breakdown in, in being able to get young girls to be able to take precautions to have safe, 
safe sex and to negotiate safe sex. And I think the infections in young girls are high, and I think it's partly because of the numbers of sexual partners that they have unsafely. But I also think it's because we live in a society in which there's a great deal of patriarchy, a great de deal of paternalism, a, an enormous lack of respect for the rights of young girls, a, a lack of respect for understanding that they need to be taught about sexuality, not just about um, safe sex, but sexuality in its widest. And I think it's a real failure of a number of the, the AIDS and HIV education campaigns is, is to look at young girls as, as highlighting an, an area of risk and always to put a negative slant on it, as to say it's a bad thing for, for young girls to be sexually active. It's, it's a bad thing if they are having lots of partners. We don't do the same about young boys. We don't have the same kind of shock and horror if, for young boys who are infected. And of course, their infection rates are lower. But I, I do think the infection rates of, um, a young, among young girls as a medical issue is, is a problem. And I think for social issues, it's a problem. But I think what it reflects, actually, is a society in which gender disparities, gender-based violence, abuse of women, lack of respect for young girls, all of those kinds of issues are, are feeding into this epidemic. And it's not really adequate, I think, to say, gosh, there, there are lots of young girls who are infected. What we really have to say is, how do we live in a country where so many young girls are at risk of becoming infected because they haven't the skills or society is not backing them up to be able to protect themselves? Right, Ted, as you pointed out a moment ago, I mean, there might be the level of awareness that's increasing in many sub-Saharan Africas. But as Mary points out, we have these cultural obstacles to overcome as well. Yeah. And there's so much needs to be done with regards to this cultural uh, okay. part of this, this, this particular uh, situation. But let's go back to what, what uh, the, the root cause of this explosion, uh, if you will, at least in the past, of the HIV virus on the continent. And, and as a U.S. Doctors for Africa founder of this, really what inspired me to even create this organization is the doctors per population, the lack of medical equipment and supplies, and of course the expensive ARV drugs, at least back then it was quite expensive, and to see what is really can be done to help control the spread of this HIV. And then I think as we look at some of the governments and some of the countries that I mentioned earlier, you can see progress, and that, that progress needs to be recognized and, and are also supported officially, uh, and therefore, and I think uh, uh, um, the same kind of a speed of improvement can, can, can continue. Uh, the cultural uh, barrier of this is just, uh, is just beyond me. I mean, it's just Mary has beautifully uh, explained it and, and uh, uh, what the situation and what needs to be done. Uh, Mary, let's look at some of the more recent medical efforts that are being made to counter the spread of the disease in uh, Southern Africa. Uh, as we pointed out in that report, new devices are being used, are being tested, like the antiretroviral vaginal ring. What kind of difference is that making? Well, I think, of course, it's going to make a difference, but, but I have a particular unease about trying to, to solve this epidemic through medical or biomedical interventions. I, I think that they are a very small part of the story. I, I think that, in a sense, biomedicine or medical interventions have taken the ascendancy over social scientific interventions and have taken the ascendancy over trying to understand the very, very complex societies in, in Southern Africa in which this epidemic is, is playing itself out. I certainly think that there are some good interventions. I, I think that testing and treatments are good interventions and that people should be tested if they wish to be tested. And if they don't wish to be tested, then that's their choice. They, they need to have free autonomy. I think one of the problems is that we face a terrible orthodoxy in some ways, that the, there are interventions that are designed and then those are described as being the kind of important quick fix solutions. I, I think medical male circumcision or, or voluntary as it's called, but very often not in practice medical male circumcision has been touted as, as one of these medical interventions that's going to make a huge difference. Um, medical people believe in, in voluntary medical male circumcision. Social scientists have a lot of une unease about it because we worried about the trials, we worried about the racism attached to it. It really is only for African men. It's, it's not um, punted for men of other ethnic groups in Southern Africa. 
And so I think there has to be a very good balance between the kind of orthodoxy of a, of a medical approach that comes in and says, these are new medical technologies and these are going to solve the epidemic without at the same time thinking about the very difficult ways in which people have to respond to these interventions in their homes and in different communities. Ted, I've just got a few seconds left. How much more international assistance is needed you know, from groups like yours, US Doctors for Africa? Well, a lot, and I think I think the effort must be intensified. I think you know, as the the problem obviously is not going anywhere. It's been decades now, as we were talking about HIV and AIDS, and even as of last year, 1.3 million people have died of this this terrible uh, disease. And so we must intensify our effort. The international community once again needs to realize that this thing is here and continue to be here unless we recognize the problem that's exploding in some parts of Africa due to various reasons, and we must provide the continent of Africa with the, the right and the necessary tools, whether it's a new invention or new drugs or medical manpower, and most importantly, to help this African nation build their healthcare infrastructure right. and train more and more Africans, because groups like mine and others, we are what I call firefighters, and we go out and try to support those countries' effort. Ted Alamehu, Mary Crute, thanks to both of you for joining us.